I am here with Rafe Larson, who has been a wonderful guest on our on our show, <laughs> with Lauren Stanick, who's always the most gracious co-host that anyone could wish for, <laughs> even if she makes funny faces. <laughs> Subject to Change, a sustainability podcast. So the conference is called the uh, Sustainable Futures Conference. It's April 27th through the 30th. Welcome to our conversation with Rafe Larson. And I'm sort of the primary organizer. We're, we're co-hosting it with um, University, of, University at Albany and RPI, um, which first of all, just to have them as co-hosts is really great. I think because you know, to have that kind of collaboration and partnership between the kind of key academic anchor institutions of our area is symbolic and, and, it, it, and it's, it's exemplifying the kind of collaborative um, and unorthodox approach that we'll need to solve the super right. wicked problem of climate change that we're gonna need people teaming up who haven't teamed up before and et cetera, et cetera. I think UAlbany and RPI are interesting sort of collaborators because RPI has the um, architecture program and U Albany has the planning program. So they, they, they would seem like they're great compliments. Let's talk about small cities. What, what are the kind of challenges and opportunities in small cities today? Um, and in particular, these kind of post-industrial cities that um, have been inherited a lot of infrastructure, a lot of cultural baggage, a lot of demographic sort of history, um, and traditionally have kind of been maligned and seen as as um, sort of in decline, right? Check out the Sustainable Futures Conference. It's actually like a huge amount of assets that these, um, you know, they're, they're primarily in the Northeast and in the, in the Midwest, but these, these kind of smaller legacies have, mm -hmm. There's, they're sitting on this kind of gold mine of assets. So we're interested in documenting that, coming up with sort of a language to describe the both the kind of sustainable assets and opportunities and also the and this goes hand in hand the kind of equity assets and opportunities right. also. right that's great and actually what's interesting is lauren is from syracuse and i i'm from albany so i think we've both experienced the the value in in a small city but also the kind of how those cities have been painted with a pretty dirty horrible unappreciative brush Rafe also founded the Future of Small Cities Institute. There's a mindset that like, this is impossible, right? Or this is not how the things, the way things are done or like, ah, that's like a little too complicated. Like, we'll just kind of do it the way we've always done it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so combating that sort of kind of cultural, culture of complacency, culture of status quo, acceptance, I think is the, almost uh, not like the biggest challenge because like uh, asset wise, this region has like so much going for it. And we just don't always, we're, we're not good visioners, right? We're not good at like gathering up all the things that we do well. We're not like good at imagining what's possible. Um, so in some ways we're trying, like this conference is almost like a pep talk. <laughs> it's like, like, yeah. look, we have it. It's all here, let's do it, you know, so. Let's talk about access. I'm so impressed and actually just posted on LinkedIn um, that I think everybody should take a look at this conference because on top of the fabulous sessions that you have, you're really kind of walking the walk as far as equity is concerned and your price of admission. I mean, <laughs> you have made this truly affordable for literally everyone. Can you talk about how you came up with that idea? Tesla or PV panels? sustainability has kind of gotten, you know, like a bad rap over the years, this kind of elitist, you know, like, should I buy a Tesla or should I buy, you know, like that, yeah. that there's, that in order to be sustainable, you have to be wealthy, right? Mm -hmm. um, when of course, like the, those most affected by climate change, most affected by the effects of greenhouse gas emissions have been black and brown communities, frontline communities, poor communities. So that that kind of disconnect of like, should I install install solar panels in my house, and then like actually who's bearing the brunt of this, I think is a, is a is a challenge that the kind of environmentalist community has had to confront and is confronting right now. And, and now like everyone's sort of grappling with what does justice mean, what does equity mean. So I think it's a it's like well past time for this conversation to ha happen. I think you just can't, particularly in legacy cities, you can't have the sustainability conversation without having the equity conversation. 
amazing CLCPA um, act that New York passed in 2019, which put equity really at the at the center of, of, of the legislation, right? So 40% of all new clean energy investment has to go to disadvantaged communities. Um, that's incredible kind of proactive, progressive um, kind of meat to the, to the, to the, legis the legisl active legislature. People in some ways don't know what to do with it. I think they're, they're, they're still playing catch up with, okay, what does that mean? What is, right, what, right. You know, who are most disadvantaged communities? What does 40% clean energy investment look like? So we're getting there, but it's like, we have to kind of, for a lot of people, we have to teach ourselves how, how in some ways. The power of the story. There are communities, but mm -hmm. they're very um, insular and sort of yeah. separated, right? So the community of Troy doesn't necessarily talk to the community of Albany, doesn't necessarily talk to the community of Schenectady. And that's part of the challenge of when we're talking about sustainability, we, we, have, to be to, we have to be together, right? We have to work together. We have to kind of see beyond our borders um, and, and see all the good things that we're doing together. And we don't always do that. I think for me, this is where like my background has come in useful, but I'm a storyteller, right? So yeah. I can see the story, I can see the story that needs to be told. And I'm also not from here, which is, I think also an asset in some ways where I'm like, you guys got, you guys are awesome. <laughs> if you only knew, like I've been around and like, this is a great place. And the people are like, really? It is? Are you sure? Like <laughs> The potential of Albany. Like just take the, take Albany, right? So you know, a huge amount of people work in the state legislature, right? I think some, somewhere between like 80 and 100,000 people, right, work yeah. there. And most of the vast majority of them commute from the suburbs. So if we just switch something like 10,000, if 10,000 of them lived in downtown Albany within walking distance of the, of the state legislature and just walk to work or pedal to work or whatever, you know, that first of all, that would have a, a tremendous impact on like the community, the sense of downtown, the vibrancy of downtown. It would also have a crazy impact on the carbon footprint of the area. Yeah. Um, but there are like subtle, sh subtle barriers to that, right? So I talked to a bunch of people and they're like, well, that would mean walking uphill, right? There's like this like mystical <laughs> <laughs> elevation shift. Both it's ways. Like, the barrier, yeah, both ways, you know? <laughs> so those kind of things, you, when you talk to people, well, why, why isn't that possible? it begins to unravel what like they're kind of in their head is the, the barriers, you know, it's kind of. Three blocks. We have keynotes speakers in the morning and they're from all around the world and they're gonna throw out some really interesting concepts that we can all chew on, which I think is great for us to have sort of working models of what's going on elsewhere. But for me, the heart of the conference is these breakout sessions, which are led by folks like Jody. Jody's the leading one to kind of showcase what am I doing now? Like what's happening on the ground and then have that being a jumping off point for like a kind of conversation, right? Um, so it was really cool like going around our community and I was expanding our community from Glens Falls all the way down to Poughkeepsie, right? So the whole mm -hmm. Hudson Cor Corridor um, and asking people like, what are you doing? What's going on? Who should I talk to? The change makers in, in the field of sustainability aren't always the obvious ones. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who are doing interesting work in like a whole range of fields. And the range, like what's interesting is that it's not all the people that you think that, you know, a lot of them are sustainability coordinators, whatever, but we also have like Matthew Peter of the parking, you know, authority, who's like thinking about, you know, how can we exp expand the idea that people like don't use their cars to go everywhere? Like what is the, what is the asset of a parking garage as actually like a narrative tool to teaching people about Ooh. walkability? <laughs> how can we, encourage people to walk, be willing to walk three blocks as, a, as opposed to just one block. Cause like even that, you know, that engagement of like walking through a city for three blocks actually is a game changer in a weird way. You know, it sounds yeah. sad in some ways, but it like that's three blocks of storefront engagement that, you know, that's how you like, you know, hook people on that kind of pedestrian centric lifestyle. So Happy City by Charles Montgomery. To one of your keynotes is uh, uh, from Bogota. And, and that whole transition is, is actually a cornerstone of that book I'm reading, Happy City, and, and is just such a fantastic, you know, iterative process story where there was, a, there was an aspirational goal and then there, was the, there were the pieces that got you there and that as you got further, you saw other possibilities. That's really great. Yeah. And he, and uh, we're talking about Enrique Penalosa. <laughs> he, um, he's a real like, 
he's a happy guy. He's, an, he's a visionary guy and he sort of sweeps people up in the vision of what is possible. He talks a lot about like the equities of public space and how public space can be shared by the millionaire and the janitor equally, you know, that, that it's like the great leveler in some ways and that we don't always do a good job of, of celebrating our public space. And certainly that's true in the US, right? Europe has a much more robust tradition of like the town square, like the piazza. And I think uh, that idea, cause I think he, he faced a lot of challenges in Bogota, right? It's, a, it's been described as like a third world city and, and so how do you, you know, I think he created the first car free day and there was crazy pushback, right? Um, so I think what's inspiring for us is how do you, how do you create that mentality shift against certain challenges, right? How, how as, a, as a city, can you sort of say, we want to celebrate this and get that, experience that pushback, but then push through it and kind of recreate yourself. So that was why I was particularly excited to have him speak to, speak to us. Showcasing value. And I've had a lot of discussions with like, for instance, Jeff Buell, who's a developer, yeah. who's, um, who's trying to develop downtown Albany to be a, a live work environment where people are actually walking around and wanna live. And his kind of philosophy, and I think I'm, I agree with him is that you have to make downtown valuable enough, right? You have to make it a culturally rich enough space that there, you leave no option to have that, that, that connectivity to the waterfront is too strong and too valuable, honestly, from a right, dollars right. and cents point of view that the, the upkeep of the highway no longer makes sense. Journalism. I, I was writing a whole series for the New York Times about cities in transition, but like in different stages of their life cycles, right? So I was writing about Detroit and um, Sarajevo post-war, but I was also writing about London which had like reached kind of a late stage mm -hmm. uh, blight in that like they are now building glass towers that were built being bought for like 6 million pounds by absent Saudi sheikhs, you know, and not, and they were no, they weren't living there. They were just kind of buying them as assets. So these neighborhoods were dead, right? No one was living in these places. Um, so it was like a new kind of blight. And so the city was Gothenburg um, yeah. and they sort of, yeah, build themselves as like the most sustainable city in the world. And I was, I was interested, like, what does that mean? How do you do that? How, why do you make that claim? So I went there and I was just, I mean, are they the most sustainable city in the world? They're doing a really great job. But what was impressive to me was just their, um, their messaging and their, their belief in it, their valuing of it. Um, and I think if you build out that message and they do a really good job of kind of gathering up all the eggs and putting it in the basket and saying, look huh. at us, you know? Um, and some of it's bullshit, of course, some of it's greenwashing, but they're like taken as a whole, it creates a culture of positivity around and, and value around sustainability. And there was just like a really robust conversation. Every restaurant you went to had some kind of mention of sustainability and local locally sourced. It just, it infects everything so that like people kind of fall in line. And so I'm actually inviting her to a conference and said, saying, what's that story? How did that happen? Because Gothenburg was like, for a long time was perceived as sort of like an industrial it's dirty. an industrial kind of dirty city I yeah mean, i mean my dad Volvo, you know so there were it was seen it was not always the case and in fact when i, I when i had an early conversation with katarina who's coming she's like yeah the my company which was sort of a almost like a chamber of commerce but more of a sort of like um tourism business kind of like mm, entity yeah. that the city created came out of like a, a like a insult that was given to the city and like the mayor was like all right this is enough we have to do something so i think that kind of visioning is useful for for our region which as as i mentioned earlier we're not always good at gathering up our eggs and and kind of visioning what is it about this moment i'm so interested in this moment right this you know for all like the the profound pain and like the mm -hmm. economic distress and Frankly, the thing that I'm most worried about is the like educational crisis. Like, I feel like so many kids, we're not going to know the 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 great effect, like the great halo effect of what this um, pandemic has caused on like a generation of kids. I think that that's yeah. terrible. It's also given us this really crucial moment to just pause, to not travel everywhere, and I hope we take this opportunity. And I I think we will. I think like pandemics again and again have 
led to really robust periods of renaissance of like invention of and i hope that we channel the kind of goodwill and the energy that we all have towards like creating create creating some kind of resiliency creating some kind of sustainability and not just snapping back to like like the extraction consumerism that that we were sort of like uh doing before i hope and i think i think we will thinking about the long game it's really tricky, right? Because we, you know, Jody, were you there for that event we did on gentrification last yeah. year? So that was really interesting. We brought in a neighborhood activist and an academic from DC, Washington, DC. And she had this really advanced vocabulary around displacement, around development, around development without displacement, that was clearly sort of light years beyond where we were as like a sort of upstate city, because you know, if, again, this is all related to the history of our, our cities, right? That we've been through these kind of like long cycles of disinvestment, right? So it makes sense that any, all these communities are kind of like, all these cities are like, wait, you wanna, you wanna develop in our city? Great, like, and don't have any sort of standards for what that means, you know? It just, they're like, great, well, this, is, this is great, you know? A lot of people are saying, well, we're not quite there yet in terms of like gentrification. And I think the point we were trying to say was, we are there yet because now's the time when you have to put forth your kind of value system and have it reflected in zoning, have it reflected in a requirement of mixed housing. You know, you can have market rate, but you also have to have low income housing requirement of like certain kind of commercial zoning. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's a big ask for these smaller cities that are just trying to raise revenue. So mm -hmm. I think it really takes a proactive approach to um, to do the kind of things you're talking about, Lauren. It's not, it's not just it's going to fall into place because that's clear, right? If you let the market do its work, it's like gentrification is going to lead to, uh, the, the path of gentrification eventually leads to empty, empty uh, glass skyscrapers of like sh shake Saudis, right? Not, yeah. uh, not living yeah. there. So it's like, how do we make that choice in the opposite direction? And there aren't a lot of successful examples of cities that combated gentrification in really successful ways on a kind of comprehensive way. There might be like a block by block thing. Yeah. So I think I agree with you. That's like, as these cities mature and develop and, and have revitalization, the equity question looms really large. Go slow to go fast. So there's, a, there's the philosophy of regenerative practices, which is one of the philosophies is go slow to go fast. If you slow down your processes in planning and understand those long-term impacts, you will set the path in such a strong and informed way that you won't have to slow down later because you're on the right path, right? It's a very difficult thing to do. Join us to learn more at the Sustainable Futures Conference. Don't miss it. That um, conundrum of like, go slow to go fast and that regenerative yeah. sense is so true. It's like, on the one hand, we have to we have to act quickly, right? We have to act quickly, but we also have to act with a sense of like twenty years down the line, right. with our eyes on that. Like those are our goals, right? Um, and it just runs counter to so many of our systems, right? It runs counter to how we like elect people. It yeah. runs counter to like um, you know how we set up the financial year. And so, like, how do we slow people down to have these kind of longer, you know, deep rhythms as their goals? That's it's a big challenge. This has been Subject to Change, a sustainability podcast. So I'm Jody Smith-Anderson. I'm very glad that you all joined us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Rafe Larson, our guest today, and for learning about the Sustainable Futures Conference. And uh, thanks for joining us at Subject to Change. Subscribe and comment. It's really important that we create this conversation, and we can't create a conversation without you. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rafe. It was great to meet you and chat with you. Yeah, thank you to you both. Thank you so much for having me.